Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number 10 in our series Competition Policy and Strategy. Today we are going to talk about implicit and explicit collusion. So we are going to learn what it actually means that firms find a cooperative solution. Um, we are going to talk about the prisoner's dilemma that gives rise to a situation where in a static context firms are not able to collude. Um, and why we distinguish between ex implicit and explicit collusion on what the, what the two actually mean in terms of competition policy. Before we start, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. Please also feel free to comment the video and ask questions um, or discuss what you want to discuss uh, in the comment section below. So. Let us begin. Um, up to this point, in the previous lectures, we have always assumed that firms behave competitively. That basically meant that we were assuming that firms played their best response strategies in order to maximize unilaterally their profits. In this case, the market outcome was dependent on the market structure, i.e. how many firms we had, um, the firm's production technologies, whether we had economies of scale, economies of scope, and the mode of competition. So was there Cono, Bertrand, and we've also briefly talked about Stackelberg competition. Market power in our examples were in, was influenced by supply side factors, which could be potential competition, or demand side factors, such as buyer power, switching costs, or network effects. In the following, we're going to talk about cooperation between firms. And if we talk about such cooperation, then we always talk about firms that have some sort of market power. So we have to be in, a, in an oligopoly setup, because otherwise they won't have the market power to influence the market outcome sufficiently well. So it's not a mode of perfect competition that we're talking about as our competitive scenario. What we're going to analyze is, on the one hand, illegal explicit collusion, which we, uh, on, on legal terms, uh, consider as cartels. And these cartels are through our agreements on prices, quantities, or customer allocation they could also collude on the introduction of innovation or the adoption of innovation, and they could restrict the market in various ways. And this is uh, for the goal to raise profits, and this is done by a joint effort to do so. So the firms usually don't behave unilaterally optimal. Um, they act collusively in order to raise their profits. What this means, uh, we will understand in a minute. The consequence of such a collusive outcome is a loss in consumer surplus and welfare. Why? We know basically that once we get from a competitive solution to a monopoly solution, we observe increasing prices and or decreasing quantities, a loss in quality, probably, and stuff like that. And the same applies to collusion or cartels, because we assume or basically observe that firms, when they collude, act or try to act as, monop as or try to achieve a monopolistic market outcome together. Aside from this um, explicit collusion, which is illegal, there is implicit or tacit collusion. The difference between implicit and explicit collusion is basically that firms communicate explicitly in a setup of explicit collusion, whereas with implicit or tacit collusion, firms find agreement mutually without communication. It sounds pretty, um, pretty abstract, but in the end, it's, it makes a lot of sense. So let me just bring this one. Okay. So we have this new technique and it should be pretty great and it actually is. But 
I'd have to learn how to manage this one a little bit, but it actually works. So we shift this here so that it doesn't disturb us too much. Okay, so explicit and implicit collusion. And aside from these topics, we also have uh, horizontal agreements which are relevant. And there could also be vertical agreements. And these horizontal agreements that we're going to talk about are usually considered as research joint ventures and stuff like that, buyer, um, a buyer uh, a joint effort to buy inputs, stuff like that. That usually isn't uh, considered a violation of, exp of, of um, competition law because it is, render uh, is, it, it is considered uh, beneficial to consumers. That's what we're going to talk about more towards the end of chapter H. Um, what we're going to talk about today are the first two topics here. Okay, so to begin, um, the analysis, we must first analyze the problem of collusion, and that is that collusion is inherently unstable. And that is because the firms have an incentive to deviate from a collusive agreement. Why is that? Well, we're going to investigate the problem with, um, with an example where we have homogeneous goods, an inverse demand of the form 8 minus Q, in a quonoduopoly, so two firms competing in quantities, and we have symmetric uh, marginal, uh, symmetric constant marginal costs of C. So that's going to be our example. Um, standard one, which we have used multiple times so far, um, and the exact derivation and analysis of this, uh, of such a setup can be um, can be found in uh, chapter B. So if you haven't already, you can watch this video as well and you find information on that. We will introduce some indices to um, refer to certain market conducts and we use capital C for competition, capital K for co collusion, capital M for monopoly, capital D for deviation or defection and capital F for fooled. And we're just going to address or to add these indices to uh, quantities or and or profits in order to refer to these cases. And we will see what this means uh, in the, throughout the analysis. I think it's pretty intuitive in the end um, and you will see, you will hopefully see why. We're going to investigate a situation where the two firms have to, uh, where each firm has two options. They can either, either cooperate or deviate. What does cooperation mean? Cooperation means that the firms aim to increase or maximize their joint profits, right? So they don't, their, their objective is not to optimize, or their objective function is not their own profit, but the joint profit of the two firms. And we know that joint profits, or in this case, industry profits, because we have two firms, and if they jointly maximize profits, we basically maximize industry profits, and the result is the monopoly solution. So the monopoly output should be produced in total, such that the industry profit is the monopoly profit. And we can achieve that when each firm produces half of the monopoly output, which is A minus C over four in our example, and each firm then realizes half of the monopoly uh, profits, which we refer to as pi K, and this is A minus C squared over eight. Okay, so that would, that would be the cooperative solution. That's basically the, the cartel solution when they communicate or the tacit collusion agreement when they don't communicate. Okay, so what about deviation? Deviation means that a firm follows their best response function. So they basically act competitively in that case. And if both firms deviate, we are in a situation where both firms play their best response functions, and if both firms play their best response functions, we are in the competitive outcome, which is the standard Cono solution in our case, which yields profits of A minus C squared over uh, to the power of two. Uh, sorry, A minus C over three to the power of two. We immediately see that collusive profits exceed competitive profits because a minus c squared over eight is higher than a minus c squared over nine. 
right? So we would have, or each firm would prefer collusion over a competitive outcome, right? So it's better for both firms to be in a collusive agreement. If you look at this from a mechanism design perspective, then this would be referred to as a participation constraint. So each firm would be willing to participate in a cartel. The other constraint that is usually analyzed in the setup is an incentive constraint or an incentive compatibility constraint, and that would denote or determine whether um, a firm has an incentive to deviate from that, that agreement. And just because the participation constraint that each firm wants to be in a cartel does not mean that the cartel will actually arise because if the firms were in a cartel, they would potentially have an incentive to deviate from the cartel. That would mean that the participation constraint is satisfied, this one here, but the incentive constraint would be violated. And that is what we exactly look at now. So, what is our reaction function? So the reaction function in Conneau speaks basically for firm I, the argument that maximizes firm I's profit as a function of QI and QJ. And we can, um, we can determine this as A minus C minus QJ over two. So that's basically, uh, you can look up uh, chapter B where we have determined this. This would be the, um, the reaction function in our given example. Okay, and the question now is, given that firm J, so your rival, cooperates, and what would he do when he cooperates? Well, he would set the cartel output of A minus C over four. What would firm, G, firm I do in order to maximize firm I's profit, right? And if it, that would mean that the firm, firm I would play its best response function given that firm J sets the cartel output. And we know from basic equilibrium analysis that this cannot be, so this one here, cannot be a Nash equilibrium because it is not the intersection point of the best response function. So there has to be for firm I an incentive to deviate because this is not the best response given the best response of the other firm. It's not a Nash equilibrium. That means that firm I have a, has an incentive to deviate from this one. And in the given example, this deviation quantity would be exactly this one here, right? So what you do is to substitute this one here and just determine the resulting expression and you will end up here, right? So this would be the result, right? And what you see is that if firm J produces the cartel output, then firm I has an incentive to deviate from it, according to its best response function, by setting a higher output than firm K. And that completely makes sense against an economic intuition, because we have been talking about the umbrella effect already, and the umbrella effect told us that when there is a merger, for instance, and the merging parties increase the price, then the non-merging firm has an incentive to also increase its price. And here it's a pretty sim similar effect. Um, it's a, uh, the, the quantity here is an externality, basically, from the viewpoint of firm, firm I. And uh, given that firm, uh, firm J restricts the output relative to the to the equilibrium output, it would be uh, firm I would be that firm I has an incentive to set a higher output. Why? A lower output from one firm means that prices are higher than they would be if that firm would play the Kuno best response, right? And in that case, we end up with a higher output by firm I. And by doing so, it is pretty clear that firm I will increase its profits. Why is that? Well, if this is not the best response function, and the best response function is basically, as it is defined, the argument that maximizes profits, um, then it has to in, then it has to result in, a, in an increase in, in 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 profits by definition. And if we compute the profit 
that firm I would get from deviating, so given that firm J produces the cartel output and firm I produces the best response to that, so the deviation output, we will end up with this profit here, right? So you can easily uh, determine that, so just use uh, this uh, QK and this QD, determine prices, then take this price, subtract C and multiply by QD and you will arrive here, right? And what we see is that as expected, the deviation output uh, is higher than the cartel output. And that is the crucial point here. There is always an incentive to deviate from a collusive agreement, right? So you would want to be in a cartel, but once you are in a cartel, you want to deviate from it, right? So the participation constraint is, is, is satisfied, but the incentive constraint, so sticking to the agreement, is violated. And that's why uh, we will basically, in that setup here, not expect a, a, a collusion to be stable or to be formed in the first place. Why? Firm J anticipates that firm I will deviate from the collusive agreement if firm J would stick to it, right? And if firm J anticipates that, then it, and it knows that, and that's the next point here, it knows that it does not benefit from it, then um, firm J would not stick to a collusive agreement. So why would firm J anticipate, uh, so it would anticipate it, but what uh, would firm J expect? Well, if firm I deviates and firm J sticks to the collusive agreement, then profits would, would decrease to this term here. So again, use QD, QK, determine prices, and then uh, take the price, subtract C, and multiply by Q. Uh, by QK, you will end up with this term. And this term is lower than the competitive profit. That means that if firm I, um, sorry, if firm J sticks to a collusive agreement, or to a, um, yeah, to a collusive agreement, and firm I deviates from it, firm J is fooled and realize a lower profit. That's what firm J anticipates and firm J will not be able to, uh, would not stick to a collusive agreement. And since you can just interchange the indices, uh, the same applies to firm I in the first place as well. So this is usually a situation that we refer to as a prisoner's dilemma. Cooperation would be beneficial to both firms, right? So cartel, being in a cartel, would be better than to be in a competitive environment. However, there is the incentive to deviate from the cooperative, uh, cooperative solution because your um, deviation profits exceed the cartel profits. And if you are the one who is fooled, it will be a situation where you're worse off than if you hadn't cooperated in the first place. So, in the prisoner's dilemma, that's you can look it up in, in any uh, game theory textbook, the usual intuition behind it is based on a situation where there are basically two captives who are basically um, promised a reduction in their prison sentence, sentence if they cooperated with the p police and um, they would stick to their uh, to their, uh, to, uh, they would, uh, they could um, cooperate with the police or stick to their uh, agreement with their uh, with their rival inmates, basically. And we will uh, we would see that if they both wouldn't cooperate with the police, it would be better for both. Um, but each individual has an incentive to to cooperate unilaterally, and the other inmate would anticipate that, so uh, no inmate would be cooperative in this setup, right? There's a lot of, you know, um, empirical and experimental evidence on that, depends on the setup whether it uh, really occurs or not, but that's what theory tells us and we have the same intuition for cartels. Okay, let me erase that. And we continue. So, how would we analyze that? Well, what we have here is basically uh, two by two um, 
payoff matrix and we can look for the Nash equilibrium in this setup here. So what we did was basically to assume that A minus C is one and we have computed the cooperative profits, uh, the deviation profits, the fooled profits and the cartel profits and we have um, depicted them here. So one over eight would be the cartel profits, nine over 64 would be the devi deviation profits, three over 32 would be the fooled profits and one over nine would be the, deviation, uh, the, the competitive profits. Okay, and now how can we uh, determine the Nash equilibrium? Well, um, we can look the method up in every uh, basic textbook. What we basically do is to first assume uh, that from J would cooperate, so we would be here and we would uh, play through or just consider what firm I should do. If firm I cooperates, when firm J cooperates too, it gets 1 over 8. If firm I instead deviates, it gets 9 over 64, which is higher. So we underline this one. If firm J deviates and firm I cooperates, firm I gets 3 over 32. If it deviates as well, it gets 1 over 9, which is higher, so we underline this one. And since the two are symmetric, and we see here that firm I always plays deviate, we know that firm J will always play deviate as well. We could also do the same process again, so assuming that firm I cooperates, firm J would deviate. If firm I deviates, firm J would deviate as well, because profits are higher and we end up, we end up here. And we see that this is the only Nash equilibrium in pure strategies that we observe or that we would expect in that game, right? And that is basically what I have asserted or what we have asserted in the first place, namely that collusion is inherently unstable and it will not or we would not expect it to occur in a um, static Okay, so what happens if the firms compete in Bertrand? So if they compete in prices? Well, if both firms compete, or if they both deviate, competitive profits are zero. If, per, if both firms cooperate, each firm sets the cartel price. That's the difference between uh, Conneau, where, we, where each firm produced half the, um, Conneau, uh, the monopoly output. Here, each firm sets exactly the monopoly price. And the cartel profits would be exactly the same as in, 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 uh, in Conneau. It's just half of the monopoly output. Now, how can firm I deviate from the collusive agreement in Bertrand? Well, the this, this situation is slightly different from, um, from Conneau, at least from a mathematical standpoint, because in Conneau we have this nicely defined reaction function where we just insert the cartel profits here, uh, sorry, the cartel uh, quantity, and assume that firm I deviates from it by choosing its best response. Here, firm I also chooses its best response, but the re best response function has these kinks, and therefore the thing is slightly different, but from an economic perspective, it, complete, it is completely straightforward what will happen if firm, uh, firm, firm J uh, sets the cartel price, so A minus C over two, then what would firm I do? Well, it would simply deviate from this agreement by undercutting the monopoly price by a very small amount. And this undercutting basically leads in a Bertrand setup to a situation where it attracts all the consumers basically with the monopoly price. So firm I gets from deviating almost the monopoly profits. So deviation is relatively uh, is, is more attractive than in Conneau basically because in Conneau we had a situation where the increase in profit wouldn't be so severe. However, the competition output is also a lot lower in Metro. If firm J is fooled, so if firm J sets the monopoly price and firm I deviates from it by slightly undercutting the monopoly price, firm J realize exactly the, uh, the competition profits of zero because that's just the minimum here. 
Okay, so we can again draw the uh, two by two matrix again with the example of a minus c over one. And what we see is that uh, the cooperation profits are the same because it's the monopoly, half the monopoly profits. We see that the deviation profits are now exactly the monopoly profits, so they are higher than in Kono. And the uh, fooled profits are zero as well as the competitive profits. So the game looks slightly different. And that what, that's what we see in the analysis as well. So if firm J cooperates and firm I cooperates, it gets 1 over I. If it deviates, it gets 1 over 4. Definitely higher. If firm J deviates and firm I cooperates as well, firm I realizes 0. And if it deviates, it realizes 0 as well. So it looks slightly different. And we just... Uh, do the same or repeat the same process from the viewpoint of firm J. If firm I cooperates and firm J cooperates as well, we have 1 over 8. If it deviates, we get 1 over 4. That's better. If firm I deviates and firm J cooperates, we have 0. And if it deviates, it gets 0 as well. So we have three Nash equilibria. This one was the Nash equilibrium that we have expected before. And Basically, we cannot be really sure uh, what, what happens here since we have uh, three outcomes to, be, uh, to begin with. But if we assume a slight uncertainty uh, about firm J's behavior, then we would basically assume that each firm uh, deviates. So the same um, prisoner's dilemma uh, applies here as well. However, it's just a weak equilibrium because there's three, right? And that's why the thing is not so straightforward in, in Bertrand, but we usually assume that. Uh, we basically have the same situation because you know, there's almost probably no market where, uh, well, we have to be careful. It depends on where you, on what you look at. Well, but uh, the results with this, uh, with this example are less straightforward. However, what we can see, so, though, is that this cooperation, cooperation, so the collusive outcome, is definitely not an equilibrium. So we shouldn't expect that to occur as well. Okay, so what have we learned so far? Well, we have learned that with a static game, which we only, where the firms interact once, we wouldn't expect a cartel to occur. So there are, of course, multiple ways we can overcome that because the prediction of economic theory that cooperation doesn't occur is basically, uh, based on real-world evidence, obviously wrong because we have cartels out there. And um, you have the same, uh, uh, the same discrepancy between your theory and what you observe. You had that in, in various uh, disciplines uh, such as biology, um, and politics, where you basically have the same prediction that, based on the prison's dilemma perspective, there wouldn't be cooperation. And there are multiple ways we can, uh, we can attack that problem, for instance, by evolutionary game theory and uh, splitting up the problem a little bit using principal agent theory or stuff like that. We can um, uh, look, attack that problem from different angles. However, in economics and from our cartel uh, and competition policy uh, perspective, what is usually done is to assume that the market doesn't exist only once, it exists multiple periods. So the firms expect to not only compete today, but also to compete tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, and so on and so forth. And now we're going from a static game, a game that only occurs once, to a dynamic game. So to a game that is repeated in, in our sense, right? So dynamic game, Stuckelberg would also be a dynamic game. But this, we assume that we have a repeated game, which is a special uh, category of, uh, of, of dynamic games, where we just repeat the same game multiple times, right? And we assume based on economic, our economic uh, environment, that this multiple times means multiple periods. So t equals zero could be today, this month, this week, 
this year, t equals one would be uh, next year, next day, next month, whatever. And we assume that we have multiple periods and the last period is denoted capital T. We assume that in every single period t, the firms play a so-called stage game, right? And this stage, ga stage game is considered in, in, in game theory terms a subgame of this uh, repeated game. And in this ga stage game, we assume that the firms basically interact. For instance, they play a Kono game or they pr play a Betro game. So they interact today, they play a Betro game today, they play a Betro game tomorrow, and so on and so forth, right? And what we will see is that the equilibrium of this repeated game can differ from the equilibrium of the stage game. And recall that in the stage game we didn't have cooperation. And you get probably what I, where I want to go. Um, we will see that if the game is repeated, we will see or we can see collusions to be stable. In order to analyze this, we will have to assume that there is a discount factor. And this discount factor is usually assumed to be between 0 and 1. Uh, depending on what you, where you look at, this is not a, a closed interval but an open interval and we will go for an open interval uh, later um, because that's usually uh, what, is, what, is, um, what is assumed. But I wouldn't want to, or would, this is this is, makes it mathematically more easy to, to analyze the thing. Um, but in any case, the, the endpoints here, if delta is equal to zero or if delta is equal to one, they have an economic meaning and I will uh, address that as well. But from a mathematical standpoint, you usually assume that you, we don't look at the endpoints here because it makes life easier in the end. And this discount factor is, um, is a measure of patience. We will see what this means in a minute. And we assume that this patience is basically determined based on an interest rate R, right? And we assume that this discount factor follows this function here, right? So we have a given market interest rate or we have an internal interest rate um, in a firm. And that means that if the firm earns a million monetary units in a given period, it can invest this million euros based on the interest rate R. And depending on how the interest rate is, the firm has an incentive to earn the money now rather than later. And since the interest rates are usually positive, I say usually it depends on the economic environment you are in, but usually they should be positive. And Therefore, you should have an incentive to get the money rather today than tomorrow. That means that uh, today's profits are valued higher than tomorrow's profits. That means you are impatient, right? Because you want to have the money now rather than later. Okay, and for the analysis, we assume without loss of generality that we look at firm I. Right, so we could also look at from J, they are symmetric, and we should drop the indices that makes the analysis or the notation a lot easier. Okay, so we have assumed discounting. What does this mean? Well, we have to look at the, um, at the, um, at the uh, present value of the profits, of the profit stream that a firm realizes. We have been talking about uh, discounting in the context of switching costs and here we have it more, uh, a little bit more sophisticated because we look at more periods uh, than only two as in the switching cost model. But the, the concept is the same. So what we have is a present value and this present value depends on the profits you assume, uh, you realize today. They are not discounted because it's today. Uh, you have once uh, one times the uh, discount factor times the profits you have tomorrow because if you, have, if you had uh, realized pi 1 already today, you could have invested it and you would have, uh, have had, you would have had earned an interest on this, 
And this adds up with a squared term to, uh, this carries over with a squared term to the next period. So it's delta times delta in the period two, it's delta to the power of three in, the, in period three, and so on and so forth until period capital T. Right? So your profits in period capital T are discounted by the discount factor to the power of capital T. If T is large, you can immediately see that this term here will be very low. So even if you earn a lot of money in the very far future, your discount factor will drive the value that you place on the profits that you earn in, in a very far future to a very low amount, right? So if T would be 100 and your discount factor would be 0.9, which would be relatively close to 1, we would still have uh, a very low uh, weight on the profits that you earn in period T, right? What this means is that your period zero profits, the profits you earn today, are worth much more than, your, uh, than the, the profits you earn later. Okay, you can use the summation formula or notation to, to, uh, to, to write this down as well, um, but what is behind that is basically this one. Okay, so just as an example here, we assume uh, per period profits equal to 10 for each period. We have four periods, discount factor of 0.9, which would which, uh, be equivalent to an interest rate of around 11.11%. And what you see is that your present value would be in the first period you earn today, you earn 10. In the next period you earn 10, but your discount factor is 0.9, so you earn nine. In period two, you have um, 0.9 times 0.9, which is 0 .81, uh, 0.81 times uh, your profits would be 10. So you have, um, so the peer at two profits would be worth 8.1 from the viewpoint of today, uh, which is captured here. And your period three profits would be worth 7.29 uh, in period zero. And your period four profits would be worth 6.561 in period zero. Although the profits that you earn in that period are 10 as well. And you see that your present value in that case is 40.951. If you had assumed that delta is equal to zero, we would be in the so-called myopic situation. So all the profits fr uh, from tomorrow to period two are ba basically worth nothing, right? Whereas if your discount factor is one, you don't discount. Then you are not impatient at all, right? So you, it doesn't matter whether you earn um, your per period profit in every period, and we would get to 50 here, right? Okay, so, um, Based on this intuition, we can analyze our prisoner's dilemma again, right? And the intuition behind this analysis is that a deviation is profitable in every period, still the same as in, the, uh, in our basic example. However, a deviator knows that it will be punished in future periods. How does this punishment look like? Well, we could assume, and that's the so-called grim trigger strategy, that once you deviate, nobody else will cooperate with you ever again, and you will only realize competitive profits in every future period, right? So that's the idea. I hope that this will become clearer when we dig into the analysis. So, we first look at the present value in competition. What does it look like? Well, in competition, assume that that is basically uh, based on the assumption that in every period, each firm deviates. And we start in period zero, in period one, period two, and so on. We always have competition or deviation. So in each period, we have the competitive profits. That's the same. Right, and we can use uh, um, uh, the, the we can just basically factor out the um, uh, the the uh, it's an infinite infinite geometric uh, 
or not, it's a finite symmetric, uh, finite geometric series that we have here. And if we, um, if we uh, reduce this one, we can get to this formula. Um, it's basically attached to the appendix of uh, chapter H1's, um, H1's uh, uh, lecture, or, or to this lecture notes, um, how it is actually done. You will see that um, towards the end of the next video. So it's a practice for you. it's left for you as a practice so far till next week um, for you to to try to solve this one. You can find it in every basic textbook, and the uh, the thing is not too difficult. For now, it doesn't really it's not too important how we get from here to here. It's more important to understand the the intuition behind it. So we have this term here, and then we look at the present value from collusion which is basically the same as this one. Uh, the only difference is that we assume that um, if the firms always collude, we always have the quartet profits in every period. So what about deviation? So if we deviate in period zero, that means that today we get the deviation profits, right? And they are not discounted because it's today. In all subsequent periods, we get competitive profits. That's the grim trigger assumption, right? So from I deviates today, form J observes it, observes it and will never ever uh, cooperate again. So we always have the competitive outcome because from I will not unilaterally start cooperating again. So the only uh, it, from I knows that from J will always play uh, uh, competition and deviation, so firm I will also always deviate, and this is the only uh, equilibrium that we have. So starting from period T, so tomorrow, uh, each firm in every period, sorry, firm I in every period uh, realizes the competitive profits. Okay, again, geometric series, we will end up with this term here, so notice the difference here. Again, mathematical thing. Um, we just use the formulas right now, and I refer you to the uh, uh, to, to to the solution in the, uh, towards the end of the next video. Um, okay. So, how can we, based on what we have learned or what we have derived so far, um, how can we solve that for an equilibrium? Well. Um, what we will basically do is just compare the present values and see what's better for the firms. However, um, we have to do some, or we have to talk about some basic, uh, basic concepts here because what we basically have is not a standard Nash equilibrium, but a so-called subgame perfect equilibrium. And the concept goes back to Hazani and uh, Reinhard Selten and also John Nash. They all received the Nobel Prize jointly for it. Um, a subgame perfect equilibrium is meant as a Nash equilibrium in every subgame, uh, and it must not contain any uncredible threats, right? So, how can you imagine that? Well, if you assume that firms cooperate in every period, but this wouldn't be uh, optimal for for one of the firms from the from the present value perspective, then it would not uh, it would not be subgame perfect because it contains a non-credible threat which is to, uh, to never deviate, basically. And we now uh, suppose that we have a finite game, which means that capital T is, is, a, finite, uh, is a finite integer. And then we can apply the so-called Selten uh, theorem, which is based on Reinhard Selten, who lived from 1930 to 2016. And what it basically, uh, what it in our context basically means that if we are in the latest period, period capital T, then we know that there is no future period. And if there is no future period, there will be no punishment. If there is no punishment, then we are basically uh, pushed back to where we started, so deviation will always be profitable. That means that both firms will, period, will deviate in this last period. So we now go back to period T minus one. Each firm knows that the other firm will deviate in the next period. And if they know that they will deviate in the next period, there will be punishment anyway, so they will deviate in T minus one as well. <laughs> 
So you get the intuition, you go back every period until to period zero, and you will see that there will never be cooperation in a finite game. That's at least what our uh, theory predicts. If we look at experiments, the evidence is, as far as I know, not so clear. Um, but that, again, is what theory tells us. And Vitko, again, this is, this is a realization of the, of the Selten, or an application of the Selten theorem. And the Selten theorem says that if there is a game with a single Nash equilibrium, um, and we know that this single Nash equilibrium, uh, sorry, if the game is played a finite number of times, we know that this single Nash equilibrium will arise in every subgame, right? What this means here is that if deviation, deviation, so both firms playing competitively, is the Nash equilibrium in every period, and we have a finite number of, uh, of, of periods, then this is the only equilibrium also in the subgame, in the, in, the, in the repeated game. Okay, so we have to uh, go away from the finite repetition to an infinite repetition, right? And that's, called, uh, that's what we have here, a so-called super game, a game that is repeated uh, infinitely often. And what we see if we do that is that the discount factor um, that we place on the last period is basically zero because if we take a number that is between zero and one and take it to the power of infinity plus one, uh, the, remaining ter the, the resulting term is basically zero. Um, and that has uh, some implications for the mathematical treatment, basically also for the economic one, because we know the last period is basically worth nothing. Um, but the last period is uh, so far in the future that it's infinitely far in the future. Um, if we compute our, uh, our present values for this one, and we note that this uh, last period basically has a, uh, has a uh, weight of zero, we have a so-called infinite geometric series, and we get to a slightly easier functions here. So if we take this term here, so the discounted um, per period profits for an infinite repetition, we get to 1 over 1 minus delta times pi c. Again, I refer to the appendix for a solution um, or visualization proof how we can get there. Uh, again, for now, it's not important to have the mathematics behind it. We just need the terms. And here you see the terms, right? So the present value for competition would be one, minus, 1 over 1 minus delta times pi c. The present value for collusion would be 1, minus delta, 1 over 1 minus delta times pi k. And the present value for deviation, given that we have a current trigger strategy, is deviation profits in the period zero. And um, the discount from, from tomorrow, uh, we get always the competitive, uh, the competitive profits and we uh, write this out as today uh, deviation profits and the present value would be delta over 1 uh, minus delta times pi c. What we can see is that um, vc, so the present value from collusion, is lower than the present value from cartel. Why? Because pi c is lower than pi k. We can also see that the competitive uh, present value is lower than uh, the deviation present value because we know that uh, in the first period here, so you can factor this out to um, pi c plus delta over 1 minus delta pi c. And you can immediately see that this term here is the same as this term. However, this term is not the same and this pi d is actually larger than pi c, so the present value from a deviation is um, always higher than the present value from, uh, from, from, devi uh, from, from um, competition, right? What does this mean? Well, competing from the first period until also from, from today to infinity is dominated, you would start to collude and deviate from it, right? So that's what you would prefer. Okay, so that basically means that we don't have to investigate VC in any way, right? Because it's not important for our, uh, for our question here whether a cartel is stable or not. So let me delete that. Okay, now, now we look at whether a cartel is stable or not. So, 
How can we determine that? Well, the driving factor is the discount factor, right? And again, the discount factor measures the patience of the firm. The higher your delta, or the lower your interest rate, the higher the value that each firm places on future profits. Look at the two extremes. If delta is zero, you place zero weight on tomorrow's profits and all the profits thereafter, so you will always deviate because deviation pays off, right? Because you're never punished because, uh, well, you are punished, but you don't care, right? Um, whereas if uh, delta is equal to one, the thing looks slightly different. A deviation offers short-run gains because your deviation um, from deviating you get today additional profits of pi d minus pi k, which is positive, right? But that you get only today. Because if you deviate, you will be punished. And if you are punished, you lose pi k minus pi c, pi c in every subsequent period until the end of the game, which is in infinitely many periods. And that's the so-called long-run loss, right? So you get a short-run gain from deviation, pi d minus pi k, but you lose pi k minus pi c in every period that comes after the deviation. And the thing is that our collusion is considered to be stable if and only if the pre present value from collusion exceeds the present value from deviation. We have a larger than or equal sign here. You could also use a strict one. It depends on what you assume regarding indifference, right? Um, I'll get to that in, in a minute. Okay, so when is this the case? Well, the thing is pretty easy. We just substitute for pi k, our term that we have just derived. We substitute for vd, the term that we have just derived on the, last, uh, on the, on the, on the previous slide. And now what we have is a term that is basically only dependent on, uh, or, well, we have an inequality that is only dependent on delta or discount factor because pi k, pi d, and pi c are determined by our primitives, so basically the stage game profits, right? And from the super game perspective, we can just assume that they are given, which is true, here. And if we rearrange this one, right? we get to this term here, right? On the left-hand side, you have your long-run loss. Oh, sorry, there should be like this one. You don't see it nicely. So this would be larger than or equal to uh, based on what we have assumed before. So our long-run loss, um, if we, again, rearrange, we get to this term. Our long-run loss, if we, uh, from, from the subsequent period, so starting in t minus one, and your short-run gain that you realize in t equals zero. So again, the connection between the, our intuition, our long-run loss and short-run short -run gain, we get immediately from comparing the uh, present values, and we see that this is basically how the thing looks like, right? Because your uh, long-run loss is multi has to be multiplied by delta uh, over one minus delta, because it, it appears uh, often, whereas your additional uh, profits from deviating, your short-run gain, appears only once, right? Okay, so what we can see from an economic perspective is that if you look at your long-run loss, that is that your long-run loss gets more severe the higher your delta. Why is that? Well, economically, pretty, uh, pretty intuitive. If you are very patient and you lose profits in every period uh, f starting from tomorrow and you place a high weight on it, um, you basically, deviation hurts, right? And the punishment of, from, of deviation hurts. Whereas if firms are completely myopic, delta is zero, well, the long-run loss, long loss is also zero. Well, this can easily be seen here. Zero, 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 right? So your long-run loss will be zero and you will never cooperate because your, your short-run gain is always positive, right? We can also see that the short-run gain is, of course, independent of delta because it is immediately determined, right? or it immediately realizes. 
And we can use the intermediate value theorem based on our, um, our previous uh, definitions of VK and VD to show that there always exists a discount factor between 0 and 1 such that you're indifferent between colluding and deviating, in other words, to a point where um, the two functions vk and vd uh, intersect, right? So we can apply the intermediate value theorem, uh, we can define the difference of your cartel profits, uh, sorry, present value in a cartel minus present value in deviation, just um, insert the functions here, and then you assume that delta approaches zero, then uh, we have delta v being negative, Right, because your short-run gain, the term here, um, will be uh, this term here is positive. This one is positive, so minus a positive term is negative, and the first one disappears. Pretty clear. Um, whereas if delta approaches one from below, then we can see here that we basically have this term here <laughs> approaching infinity. So uh, this one will become infinite as well. So. Uh, the difference here will approach infinity, so we go, go from, uh, from a negative term to an infinite term, so we cross the zero line. So it would be basically, it looks like this, so we get, well, that's not true, but uh, you see the intuition, right? So you cross the point where uh, delta v is zero, and if delta v is zero, we have vk minus vd. Right, and of course, there's this. Uh, uh, it's it's pretty clear that delta v has to be continuous. Otherwise, there could be a jump in this in this function. But this is not true here because the function is definitely uh, continuous in delta. Right, this one here. Okay, so what do we learn from this? Well, we learn from this that there is always a point. Well, there's always a degree of patience, a discount factor, where the firms are indifferent between deviation and collusion. If the actual discount factor is higher than the discount factor for which the firms are indifferent between deviation and collusion, we know that they are patiently, patient enough to collude or for, for collusion to be stable. If the delta, if your discount factor is below that value, uh, then you are not patient enough for collusion to be stable, and therefore you will not observe collusion, right? And we define the discount factor for which the firms are indifferent between competition, a uh, bit between collusion and deviation, um, by delta crit. So, if we take this equation here and rearrange it with respect to delta, we get to delta crit. We have done that here. So we want uh, VD minus VD, uh, VK minus VD, so that difference to be zero. And that occurs if our uh, cartel, sorry, that might be, yeah, well, the, the, the deviation would be, uh, uh, would be, um, uh, would be pi d minus pk, so the, f uh, the, the short run gain from a deviation, uh, long run uh, loss here um, on the other side, and we can rearrange this with respect to delta um, to get to this term here. So this is basically our critical discount factor that determines <coughs> when the firms are indifferent between uh, colluding and deviating from a collusive, collusive agreement. And whenever our actual discount factor exceeds the critical discount factor, we know that firms are sufficiently patient and collusion will be stable, whereas if our actual discount factor is below the critical discount factor, then firms are too impatient, they value the future not enough for collusion to be stable, right? And in this case, collusion is not stable. Okay. We use um, a symmetric Cournot duopoly with a linear demand of 24 minus p and costs of zero to, um, to, to illustrate this one. If we use this one, this example, to compute uh, the stage game equilibrium or equilibria, 
we see that, uh, well, sorry, we, in order to compute the stage game outcomes, um, so the Conneau equilibrium, uh, the, Conneau equilibrium uh, the cartel outcome and the deviation uh, outcome, we get to these numbers here, right? So just insert uh, what we have here into the formulas that we have just seen or what we have done in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in lecture B. And we get to these numbers here, right? So competition would be 64. It would be better to be in collusion at 72, but deviation is even better, so you get 81. The present value from collusion is uh, 72 uh, over one minus, uh, one, one minus delta. The present value is your deviation profits plus the, uh, uh, the, the competitive profits, 64 times one, delta over one minus delta. And now you want to know whether collusion is stable, so you want to have VK to be higher than VD, and that is the case if delta exceeds 9 over 17. And that 9 over 17 is our critical discount factor, right? Which you could determine by uh, setting these two equal to uh, one another and rearrange with respect to delta. And you will see that you arrive at 9 over 17. Equivalently, what you could do would be uh, again, oh, it works, it works, it works. Okay, so what you could do equivalently would be to, uh, to look at your short run gain, which is uh, pi d minus pi k, which is nine. You could also look at your long run loss, which is pi k minus pi c, which is eight. So per period, you lose eight, such that in, uh, uh, in present value terms, it would be eight times delta over one minus delta. And your collusion is stable if your short run gain is, well, again, we would, need to use uh, a weaker, uh, uh, weak inequalities here. And we would want to have nine to be uh, smaller than or equal to eight times delta over one minus delta, which is the case when delta is um, weak, weakly exceeds nine over 17. So same, same result, but pretty clear. So what do we learn again from this example? If your critical discount factor exceeds nine over 17, collusion is stable. If it does not, it's not stable, right? Okay, so what happens if we have not Conneau, but Bertrand? Same, um, same market, uh, uh, but a different mode of competition. Our uh, results in the stage game would be uh, collusion would be 72 as before. Competition, well, <coughs> it's a symmetric Petra game, so your uh, competitive profits would be zero. We can immediately see that the long run loss is larger than in Kono because the long run loss in uh, Kono would be positive here. It's uh, sorry, the, the, the profits in the subsequent periods after deviation would be positive here, they are zero. If you deviate, you get the monopoly profit, which is 144, and we also see that the short run gain is larger than in Kono, right? So here the short run, uh, the long run loss was 64 times delta over one is delta, and deviation was 81. Here we see uh, long run loss is, uh, is, um, uh, is, is more severe because you lose basically your entire, um, your entire uh, cartel profits of 72 in every period. But deviation is also more attractive, so it's not per se clear um, which one is, is uh, where cartel is more stable or not in Conneau and Bertrand, but we can do that in our example. So we can compute the present value from collusion, which is uh, just 72 times uh, over, 72 over 1 minus delta, just as before. In Conneau example, um, whereas if we have deviation, well, our um, our present value would be 144 because you get today your deviation profits and every subsequent period you get zero, right? So the present value is, of deviation is, is slightly, is, is, is a lot, uh, looks a lot easier. And your collusion is stable if VK exceeds VD and we can basically immediately see that um, delta has to be greater than one half. So the critical discount factor in Bertrand is one half. Right? And if your actual discount factor exceeds one half, collusion is stable. 
And what we can see is that collusion is more stable in our Bertrand example than it is in Conneau because the critical discount factor in Conneau is higher than in Bertrand, right? That means that if you have like, uh, if you draw a line here from zero to one, your discount factor in Bertrand would be at one half, your critical discount factor. Uh, and in Conneau, it's somewhere here, right? So the, uh, the, the ratios are certainly not correct, but uh, you get the idea, right? So uh, the range that uh, is supported as, an, as uh, collusion to being stable is greater than the range in Conneau. So we would assume that in Conneau, uh, collusion is less stable than in Bertrand because more discount factors in our interval are supported in a sense. Okay, so now that we have learned some basics on repeated games and how collusion works, we can now uh, put this to, uh, to or we, come, we can use these concepts to uh, get to our points on implicit and explicit collusion. In our example, it was the threat of punishment that was sufficient <coughs> to stabilize collusion because each firm anticipated when it deviates, it would be punished. So there would have basically been no need to communicate, right? And if, there is, if communication doesn't happen, we talk about tacit collusion, right? And that's also important in our model because um, tacit collusion depending on uh, the jurisdiction. Basically, currently, it's, it's always uh, legal, to the best of my knowledge, um, because it's very hard to detect when firms play tacit collusion uh, versus they play a basic market equilibrium. But anyway, so tacit collusion um, would not be illegal, so there's no fines involved. Whereas if we assume that we have explicit collusion, then we would have a certain period to incorporate expected fines, which we will do in the next lecture. But right now, um, we talk about tacit collusion, so we have just analyzed a situation where, um, where coordination or collusion can arise naturally, basically, in the market when the firms are sufficiently patient. And uh, there is um, uh, a paper, basically a report to the European Commission, DG Comp, that Mark Ivaldi and uh, other authors, um, very famous authors, have written in 2003. And they characterize tacit collusion as a market outcome where firms realize super competitive profits. Well, that's basically what we have determined. Pi K was exceeding Pi C. So you are in a cartel, basically, uh, without communicating. So just a cooperative outcome. Um, the firms agree tacitly, so they don't have to communicate and set prices uh, above the competitive level, or they restrict quantity to a level that is com below the competitive level. Without communication, just because because they expect uh, punishment if they don't, right? And they are sufficiently pat patient. This, of course, requires uh, repeated interaction, which we have saw, seen in the, in the beginning, because if you play the prison dilemma once, you won't expect the firms to cooperate. And what is clear is that uh, an agreement requires sufficiently severe and certain punishments. You can incorporate into that model, and that has been done in, liter in the literature. There's a lot of uh, lot of papers on that. If you incorporate any any type of uncertainty in it, and uh, then things start to get messy, basically. Okay, now. Um, from a competition policy standpoint, a very uh, fundamental point is explicit collusion or cartels. <coughs> we will talk about the, uh, the legal treatment in the next lecture. However, um, the, the economics behind it is that we have the same goal as, as in, as in uh, tacit collusion. So the firms try to maximize their joint profits. However, they are allowed to communicate and they agree to set certain prices, rebates, uh, they restrict innovation. They want to share. Uh, they, they 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 want to share the markets among them, or they want to allocate customers. Um, that's different types of these hardcore cartel agreements that we uh, uh, observe in reality. 
And this is done by communication. And as soon as you communicate, you are in explicit collusion. And this explicit collusion is considered as a per se infringement, basically in every, uh, in every uh, jurisdiction, right? So Article 101, Treaty for the European Union, uh, Sherman Act, Section 1, and uh, Paragraph 1 in, in German GBB, that basically determines this per se infringement. In reality, it's also important that some cartels involve side payments. There's a, uh, an illustrative paper by Harrington and Skripach in, uh, most likely I spelled this name wrong, but it's written, it's, it's in, uh, published in AER, and it uh, analyzes very well how in the citric acids cartel, firms utilize side payments in order to uh, stabilize their cartel, right? And that's moving away from the tacit uh, agreements where there's no communication and the firms just mutually agreed without explicitly uh, talking about it uh, to a point where they simply talk, right? And if they do, then it becomes illegal and uh, their talk is basically, or their communication is basically the smoking gun, which will be determined or will be detected, can be detected by the competition authorities. Now, if we look at the literature, it's not really clear how this communication between the firms actually works, right? So from an economic theory uh, and economic um, research standpoint, we cannot really say what happens here if they communicate. We could say that it solves coordination problems because we know that um, in a super game, every price above marginal cost is an equilibrium, right? But which price should we set? So we could talk and determine that price. But that doesn't always apply to real work cartels, so that's probably not the explanation for everything. It could also be that we have uncertainty and uh, we have more than two firms and we want to detect a deviator by communicating. So pooling our information on quantities and see which firm has deviated. Of course, you need more than two firms because you know that you have deviated or not. And if there is a problem, if there is a market outcome that is not consistent with what you believe to be, uh, to be the result of a cartel, you know that the other one deviated, right, if you didn't. But if you have more than two firms, the problem gets uh, less trivial, and there's a lot of work on this, uh, for instance, by Avaya and Krishna, but there's also earlier articles in that one. So, based on this environment, the firms could, co could communicate, but that requires that the firms actually pool their information on outputs and market shares or stuff like that in order to infer who deviated. But that also doesn't occur always in reality, so that's also not the solution to everything. And aside from that, there has been a lot of experiments uh, done on this one, and um, the results are basically depending on the uh, on the given market. They are pretty interesting, um, and it depends also that we see that also depends on the type of information. Is is it hard information, so something that is verifiable? Is it soft soft communication? So. Um, do they just loosely talk? And uh, there's, uh, for instance, the, uh, the work from of, of Fozeka and Norman, and there's a lot of papers on there that you can uh, look up or, um, you know, just Google experiments or just look up in a given uh, search engine experiments collusion or experiments cartel and communication, and you will find a lot of papers on that. Okay, so. That's all I want to tell you today. I know that it was quite uh, quite a bit, um, but this topic is basically one of the most central topics to this uh, to this lecture. So I hope that uh, you understood most of it. Basically, ideally everything. But um, again, usually we would have. Um, uh, an exercise class where we uh, where we dig into that topics even more and if you're looking this or if you're watching this video as part of for instance our uh, next uh, lecture in the summer term 2023 and you're for instance part of our VIP program that we offer at University Gießen um, you can have the opportunity to participate in an exercise class where we do exercises to basically get a better understanding of the concepts that we use.
Okay, so before we finish, please make sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel, tell your friends that there's good economics that we do here and that they can learn a lot if they, if they watch the videos. Um, please, feel also free, please also feel free to, to leave comments below and uh, see you in the next one. Thank you.